Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for joining this session today. It's part of HMCTS's public user event. My name is Rosemary Rand, and I oversee a number of projects within the HMCTS reform programme, which are aimed at improving the planning of court and tribunal hearings and how you can attend those hearings by phone or video as well as in person. Um, this session is about attending a court or tribunal hearing remotely. We've called it a remote hearings what next because, as I'm sure you know, uh, the COVID pandemic completely turned on its head how we think about what attending a hearing means. Because of the pandemic, large numbers of hearings have been conducted with some or all of the participants joining by telephone or video over the last 18 months or so. So we're going to look today at what's coming next as we all adjust to a sort of a new normal. Um, as part of the reform programme, we've been developing a video hearing service, which is actually designed specifically for court and tribunal hearings. Today, you're going to meet the team leading the design of this service and hear about what you can expect to see as users coming to a court or tribunal hearing in the coming months. This session is a cross jurisdictional one. We're going to be talking about video hearings across all the jurisdictions, the criminal courts, the civil and the family courts, and in tribunals. I'm going to introduce Claire Jukes, who is the service manager for video hearings within HMCTS. And she's going to tell you about the new video hearing service, and then there will be time for discussion with Claire and myself and others from the team. So the, there's a Q&A function which is now live. Please do use that Q&A function in the Teams uh, live event and send us your questions as we go. Thank you very much for joining this event. It's really great to be able to talk to you all and I'll hand you over to Claire to take you through the presentation. Thank you. Thanks Rosie and hello to everyone joining this session. So after widespread use of audio and video hearings during the pandemic, what does the future look like for remote hearings? This session looks at how the HMCTS video hearing service is being introduced and what it means for court users and the organisations that support them. At last year's event, I spoke in my former role where I was leading the tactical video hearing solution, which you may know as Cloud Video Platform. HMCTS rolled this out in response to the pandemic. And we did this by equipping courtrooms with the technology to enable hearings to take place remotely, developing guidance and onboarding users at pace. After a year in which the vast majority of hearings took place remotely, we can look at what we've learned about remote hearings and the role they will continue to play in the justice system. Firstly, we'll look at how audio and video hearings have enabled us to keep justice going throughout the pandemic and the lessons we've learned as a result. I'll talk about the transition to our strategic video platform, the Video Hearing Service, we also call it VH, and why we're moving across and how you can be ready. I'll be showing you the user's view of the Video Hearing Service and also trailing the new video guidance for lay users designed and developed in an exciting project with the Oxford University Faculty of Law. Video has been used in courts long before COVID. It has enabled certain participants, including vulnerable witnesses, to join a hearing remotely. BT Meet Me has also been the audio option for those participants unable to join a hearing via video. A wider use of video is planned as part of the HMCTS reform programme, but certainly not at the scale and speed at which these platforms are rolled out. The use of CVP was extended and has done a great job, but it was not designed to be used as it currently is. Microsoft Teams has also been used, but this creates administrative overheads for the service, particularly with regard to processing recordings of hearings. Ultimately, CVP and Teams are video conferencing systems who are not designed for formal court proceedings. The video hearing service has been designed in partnership with the judiciary to hold court and tribunal hearings. And whilst it was not ready to be used at scale when the pandemic hit, jurisdictions are now transitioning across. More about VH in a moment. Remote participation has a continuing role. It's a basic principle, the appropriate means of each hearing will be decided by the judiciary. What has been widely acknowledged is that for suitable hearings, remote participation should remain an integral part of the system and as a fundamental attending court or tribunals in person. Not having to be physically present in a court or tribunal building can reduce stress for some of our most vulnerable users and also reduce travel time and cost. 
For others, remote participation can remove the worry of being in the same room as people who they are in conflict with. CVP, Teams and the VH service have proved the concept of remote hearings during the pandemic and we've learned a lot in the process. VH was initially designed to operate from devices that are more likely to be stationary, such as desktops and laptops. The increased use of video and the need to offer a wider choice of devices to access hearings has been acknowledged. With participants joining by phone, it was essential to offer an 0800 number. With video hearings, hearing participants have an account set up to give the judge clear on-screen information on who is participating and to give video support staff details to contact in the event of a problem. However, we learned that courts needed to add a more flexible option for last minute changes. The design for interpreters and their clients so they can see, hear each other and be heard by the judge when needed, together with a simultaneous translation that does not disturb proceedings, is a more, far more complex when using video. Video hearings is a web based service and therefore firewalls can also block access to it. However, by listening to the experience of the judiciary, court users and staff, the service now looks very different and we've induced the ability to allow access to, apologies, to allow users to access the service from smartphone and tablets. Those without suitable equipment or equipment fails can join the hearing by way of telephone. Last minute participants, including observers and the media, can join the hearing using a quick link instead of needing an account to be set up and simultaneous translation for participants requiring an interpreter is now available. Court users are to engage in advance of video hearings being introduced and pre-hearing guidance has been improved with check-in sessions being set up for users to test their firewall settings. This is over and above the self-test that part of the service. For the judiciary, there's a range of in-hearing controls. These include mute and unmute, raise and lower hands, admit and dismiss witnesses, pause and resume the hearing, close the hearing and consult with panel members in private. For unclerked hearings, support is provided by video support officers who monitor hearings using a dashboard. For clerked hearings, there will soon be a dual host feature enabling the clerk to facilitate the hearing. So let's see what the service looks like from a user's perspective. You'll now see a short video. The video hearing service has been specially designed so people can attend their hearing without having to travel to a court or tribunal building. This quick walkthrough will show you how easy it is to use. Sign into the hearing and follow the instructions. You can attend a video hearing using a laptop or desktop computer or an Apple iPad. Other devices will be supported soon. It's important to check your equipment can connect to the service and we'll help you do that. If you're using a computer that's part of a network, you'll need to check with your IT support that it will work. If you don't do this, you may not be able to attend the hearing. There's a link in your hearing confirmation that will help. You must go through the equipment check from start to finish. We'll ask your permission to turn on your camera and microphone. A message may pop up asking if you want to and you'll need to allow this. A video takes you through a simple equipment check to make sure everything's working. It's very important that you complete it. Try to sit in the same place you'll use for the hearing. You can check your background looks OK and that your face isn't in shadow. You'll need to confirm that your camera is working and that you could see and hear the video clearly. A hearing held by video follows exactly the same rules as a hearing held in a court or tribunal building. You mustn't eat, you may only drink water, and you must be alone unless you've had the judge's permission. During the hearing, you must ask the judge if you need to move away from your screen or turn off your camera. Just before you enter the waiting room, you'll confirm that you won't record any part of the hearing. It's a criminal offence to record or take any images of the hearing. In the waiting room, you'll see details of the other people who are taking part. If the hearing is delayed for any reason, you'll see a message on your screen. Stand by in case the video hearings team need to contact you. When the judge is ready, everyone enters the hearing at the same time. Only witnesses join separately. They're called by the judge when they're needed. When the hearing starts, everyone's microphone is muted, so you'll need to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to speak. 
In the top right hand corner of the screen you'll see some controls. You can show or hide your self view. You can turn off your camera, although you mustn't do this without the judge's permission. You can mute and unmute your microphone. It's best to mute your microphone when you're not speaking in case there's any background noise. If the judge mutes you, you'll need to raise your hand to ask to speak or to get the judge's attention for any other reason. If a break is needed for any reason, the judge will pause the hearing. While it's paused, participants can use the private meeting rooms if they wish. It's easy to invite someone. The meeting rooms are private and, while the rest of the hearing will be recorded, the meeting rooms aren't. A countdown will appear again when the judge restarts the hearing. At the end of the hearing, the judge will tell you what will happen next. When the judge ends the hearing, you'll return to the waiting room. From here, you can use the private meeting rooms once again, or you can sign out. If you have any questions or need any help, contact the video hearings team. Okay, so moving to video hearings. The video hearing service is already in use across tax, property, employment and immigration hearings. Over the coming months, its use will extend across first tier and upper tri tier tribunals too. It's been piloted and is continuing to be used in the Birmingham Civil and Family Justice Centre. And when it's due to come to a region or jurisdiction likely to impact you, you will be advised and contacted. For those who support others through the court process, it's important to access information on the service so that you can in turn support others. If you'll be attending a hearing on video hearings from behind a firewall, you'll need to signpost your IT support to information on gov.uk to check you won't be inadvertently blocked from the service. The VH service is very easy to use. Early in 2022, you'd see the launch of a number of films to help guide and support lay participants in, re in remote court and tribunal hearings. They are the result of an exciting 18 month project with the Oxford University Centre for Social Legal Studies. There will be one generic film and four films made specifically for Special Educational Needs and Disability Tribunal, Social Security and Child Support Tribunal, Employment Tribunal and Family Court Private Law. The films have been subject to a rigorous design, testing and feedback process. It's been a fantastic joint piece of work. Each film will be subtitled in six additional languages, Welsh, Polish, Urdu, Bengali, Gujarati and Punjabi. British Sign Language versions of each films will also be introduced. Thank you for attending. It's now time to move for the questions and answers and I'll hand you over to Evelyn. Thank you very much, Claire, for the presentation. Um, and we already have the Q&A open, so please do post, your, make sure you post your questions there. Um, as a first question, uh, Rosemary, um, we were wondering that um, how can users make sure that they don't have any issues using a video hearing service? Thank you very much. Uh, that's quite a large question. Um, essentially, a lot of the design work that we've been doing has been really informed by the needs of users, recognising that for many people, hopefully coming to a court of tribunal hearing is something that you don't do that often. So we need to make this service as user friendly for people who are doing it for the very first time. So if you, are, if you are invited to your hearing and you're notified that your court hearing will be taking place using the video hearing service, you'll be provided with information about that when you get your notification of the hearing and told where and sorry when it is and you'll be provided with information about what you need to do to get ready. Um, there is a lot of guidance available on the uh, internet on, on our gov.uk pages which you can read at any point but the service builds in to the sort of pre-hearing part of the service all the things that you need to do to make sure when you join your hearing you're ready to do so. So as Claire's shown you there's a self-test uh, feature um, within the service 
Um, so essentially, uh, you, you, it, that checks the compatibility of the device that you're using, that your camera and microphone are working, and that you have got a, a strong enough network connection into the video hearing service. That means that when the judge is ready to start your hearing, um, they know that everybody who's in that hearing, all the participants are ready as well. Um, to say, just to repeat the point that, that Claire made, if uh, you are accessing the hearing from a, a corporate network, if you're if you're appearing on behalf of a company or something, or others as, as a private individual, um, you will need to make sure that you have uh, checked that your firewall settings, any firewall settings you have in your network are compatible. Again, there is guidance on gov.uk because there is a specific, you know, um, setting that you may need to, to adjust. So please do refer to that guidance. Um, the other thing that we do in this service that is different to off the shelf video conferencing uh, products is that we've actually got a, 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 a team of trained HMCTS staff who are kind of plugged into it in the background. Um, and so there are staff whose who's role is to be on hand to support users in hearings with any technical issues on the day. So there will be somebody who is able to see remotely from the actual hearing, as it were, um, whether any participants are dropping in or out. Um, and the, the judge can contact that member of staff to support the situation and they can step in and, and deal with things which may be via a variety of means, depending on what the problem is. So essentially that's what the service is trying to do is make it very easy and straightforward for users to access and then have a system in place to deal with any problems on the day. I hope that helps. Thank you very much Rosemary. Um, Claire, we have a couple of questions about uh, accessing the remote hearings. Um, where do users can get the link for the remote hearings and is it accessible uh, via Microsoft Teams? Thank you, Evelyn. Um, the remote link is basically either one of two options. You either access through the platform itself, and that's where you create an account and join the platform. Or alternatively, we have a quick links option, which is, means that the actual link will be sent out to you. That is only anticipated to be used when there's been a short notice to need to join a hearing, but those two options are both available. In relation to using Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Teams has been an option during the COVID period where there has been several platforms operating remote hearings. However, going forward, the video hearing service is the strategic solution for HMCTS and will have the wraparound support. So whilst Microsoft Teams will be available, it will not be something that will be directly supported by HMCTS moving forward. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, Rosemary, we have another question about are measures in place to ensure somebody's participating in remote hearings receive the same level of fairness as in-person hearings? Yes, and I think the whole question of fairness, it's obviously something that we, we are hugely, hugely sensitised to. It's really important that your hearing is fair and you have uh, confidence in and, and trust the outcome of that hearing, no matter what jurisdiction it is or what the matters are to be resolved, um, regardless of the mode by which you joined that hearing. Um, this is ultimately a question about justice and upholding justice. Um, and that's why the decision as to whether a hearing should be held using uh, the video hearing service or indeed, as we have today, um, telephone conferencing for certain hearings um, or calling people into the court building, that is a matter for the judiciary. Um, so in terms of uh, fairness, um, as, as with any uh, uh, issues coming before the, a court or tribunal, uh, these things can be considered and dealt with in advance. Judges are very, very sensitised to the need to make the right decision as to the appropriate mode of hearing. Um, and that's not done at a sort of blunt level of category of hearing type. It's absolutely about the combination of users within that hearing, the issues for consideration in that hearing, um, the, the length, duration, the complexity of that hearing, whether there are witnesses, what kind of evidence might need to come before the court, all these sorts of things. So there isn't a right or wrong answer as to whether a hearing should be done on video or in person. It's absolutely about making sure the uh, right technology can support the hearing, however that hearing is, is best to take place. So I think that that careful consideration about um, how you convene the hearing absolutely has fairness at its heart. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Uh, Claire, we have another question for you. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge to address in the first six months? Sorry, Evelyn, could you repeat? I didn't catch that. Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge to address in the first six months? 
sorry, I'm not sure whether that's specifically meant in such my role in relation to video hearing service. Sorry, could we have that question clarified? Let's do yes, in relation to video hearings, shall we? Okay. In relation to video hearings, I think the biggest challenge is basically making sure that everybody can be onboarded to the service. Um, it's really important that everybody can access the service and have a really positive experience. So one of the biggest challenges we have faced is making sure we can do that at scale. Um, and that's where a lot of our resources has been focused once we've got through the design stage. So I think, yes, absolutely. Making sure everybody can access the service and having a, a really good positive experience is one of the key uh, challenges we have in the first six months of uh, rolling out a service. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, we have a comment and a question. A very useful video. Uh, is it publicly available yet? And do we have a link for it if anybody would like to take the question? I, Claire, do you I know the specifics? Yeah, I know I, we have previously published videos uh, about the service on gov.uk. As you can imagine, as we continue to iterate and develop the service, we need to update those videos so that the visuals you see are as it will be used today. Uh, we will be sharing a link to this webinar after this event, so I can certainly assure you that you can see again today everything that you have seen in this webinar so far. I think I spotted a question in the Q&A from somebody who might either have been late joining or had trouble joining this webinar. Uh, so just just to say to that person, absolutely, you'll you'll be able to watch this back again later. And please do uh, contact the email uh, mailbox that we we had at the end of the presentation. We'll show again at the end of the webinar if you want to get in touch with the team at all. Thank you very much, Rosemary. And um, here's another question, just to throw it out there. Um, please feel free to pick it up. Um, is there a date uh, when video hearing services might come to crime? Yeah, I mean, video hearing service, we're going at the moment, we're looking at tribunals and moving into civil and family. Um, the aim is to move into, tri uh, into crime post March 2022. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, we have another question about I see many judges uh, have voiced resistance not to change and use a technology, but uh, that it may sacrifice justice to ease of use. How can you persuade them otherwise? Um, I don't know, Claire or Rosemary, would you like to take the question? If I might uh, come in on that one, I don't think Thank it's you. for us to uh, persuade judges and indeed I would probably disagree with the premise to the question because I think actually if you look at what's happened over the last 18 months the judiciary and HMCTS have taken a giant leap forward in the use of technology which has been on a level never seen before and at extremely short notice um, as we've all had to adjust clearly in, in many aspects of our lives but I think the courts have been uh, no no different to that so I think yes there will be a, a, a natural uh, finding its level um, of video hearings. Uh, I don't expect we would see the high levels of video hearings um, that we saw at the peak of the pandemic continuing as a, a sort of standard going forward, but neither do I think we'll go back to what we were before the pandemic with um, fairly extensive use of video links in the criminal courts but uh, and, and lots of teleconferencing in the civil courts, but fairly low levels of video uh, hearings in the in the civil and family courts. So it will be somewhere in the middle. Uh, the, the appropriate sort of um, um, usage, as I've said before, clearly it's, it's it's absolutely a judicial decision and that is taken on the needs of that individual hearing. Um, so there are no hard and fast rules about this um, and our job as HMCTS is to provide judges the tools they need to do the job to convene an effective hearing and and, uh, and and dispense justice essentially and to do so in a way that really meets the needs of users who for whom this is um, uh, for, for many public users, I'm talking about here rather than professionals and lawyers, um, an unusual and often stressful experience. So we want the video hearing service to be an option for those people for whom coming to court presents difficulties, be they practical difficulties about getting there or, or emotional difficulties because of the uh, stress of being in the same physical room as, as somebody that they are in conflict with. This is an alternative and whether it is right for a particular hearing or not, depends on the said earlier on the issues at stake and the people uh, involved in, in that hearing. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, we do have a couple of practical questions. Um, Claire, if you'd like to take this one, how is it envisa envisaged that any bundle or documents will be used or presented within the uh, video hearings? 
Thank you, Evelyn. Um, we, we do have an evidence video streaming facility coming online next month, so that will enable people to present their evidence live. Um, the actual evidence bundles, if it's through the uh, crime jurisdiction, will come through the common platform and also through the reform products for civil family and tribunals. So the video hearing server will provide the platform in which the evidence can be streamed. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, we have a question around uh, the ethics or the recordings of the sessions. Uh, are all remote hearings recorded? And if so, can parties obtain recordings? If not, why not? Um, if either of you would like to take the question. I, I can take that one and Claire, do feel free to come in. Um, so the rules on recording hearings, an audio recording is taken of the hearing. Um, if it would be a hearing that would be audio recorded where we're not taking place on video. So those rules are jurisdictionally specific. Um, and if you, you are able to request an audio recording of your hearing, if one was taken, regardless of whether it was conducted in person or over video. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the next question would be, uh, will litigants with no internet access or limited data allowances always be able to have a physical hearing if they need one? Uh, Claire, if you'd like to pick up the question. Thank you. As Rosie said before, ultimately the way the hearing is conducted is the matter for the judiciary. So if there are, a litigant is not suitable for whatever reason, including obviously not having access to um, a device or indeed suitable internet access, then yes, a physical hearing will always be available for them. Great, thank you very much. Um, is there any intention the role uh, Sorry, is there any intention on the role of the uh, video hearing service uh, out in the High Court? Is that not clear to what extent, if at all, uh, the CVP has been used in the High Court? Um, that's a question for either of you. Uh, shall, shall I take that one? Um, so uh, if the High Court Judiciary would like to use the service, we're very happy to support them to do that. So as Claire said, our, our focus at the moment is um, uh, across the tribunal chambers and the services in live use in several of those chambers. Uh, we are um, doing some testing and piloting uh, to introduce it across the civil family courts and we will turn our attentions next to the magistrates and the crown courts. Um, so there's a lot to be done there, uh, but we're also, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of interest in the service. So we are talking with, with other um, potential users as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is on will there be any assistance for participants to have to pay for data or connection costs to join the video hearings? Um, Claire, if you'd like to pick this up. Um, no, I mean, in relation to costs, that would be obviously observed by the actual users themselves. I mean, we do have the 0800 number for audio participation. So if there were some challenges in that area, but um, no, certainly uh, use of video services would be at the cost of the user themselves. Thank you very much. Um, Rosemary, is there any, um, how does the simultaneous interpreting, interpreting work? Um, will there be any interpreters visible? Uh, does anybody get to hear the original version or can anyone uh, only hear the interpreter? Um, so, yes, it's really important that we're able to support uh, uh, users that need an interpreter with them. Um, I, I'm not sure I can explain very well how it works without a visual, so maybe we can mock up an image of that or something and share it with the, the materials at some point. But essentially, it varies depending on whether you are um, uh, having sort of simultaneous interpretation or consecutive interpretation, we need to support both. We're also looking at things like British Sign Language interpretation. Um, so essentially we have people in a different uh, window um, and then that is managed within the hearing so that the right person is seen and heard on screen at the right time. So this is something that obviously the judge will want to control um, during the hearing um, uh, but uh, and, and make sure the hearing runs smoothly so that the person needing interpretation um, is having that feed to them. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 the conversation in the primary language of the hearing, obviously in English or, or, or indeed Welsh, um, is, is kind of continuing. So that is managed quite carefully. Great, thank you. Um, and another question, uh, when the programme is fully rolled out, what proportion of hearings are expected to be online, via the phone or in person? Um, it's a question for either of you. Uh, 
Um, I don't think we, we would actually make any assumptions around the proportion of uh, hearings to be either on telephone, video or indeed face to face. Ultimately, uh, the decision at the mode of trial is obviously in relation to the judiciary. Um, we'd obviously like to think that there would be a, a good usage of video hearings going forward because of the value they bring to the justice systems. However, this is not a decision of HMCTS. It is a decision for the judge who makes a decision of the hearing. Thank you very much, Claire. We have about another 10 minutes um, for the uh, questions. Um, and Claire, I was wondering if you could answer this one. Is video hearing different to CVP and if so, how so? OK, yeah. I mean, principally, they are both a video hearing, but the platforms are fundamentally different. Um, whilst they're built on the same base, the VH service has been designed in conjunction and partnership with the judiciary. So the features and functionality of the VH service actually reflect what is needed in a video hearing, as opposed to a CVP being a video conferencing facility. So the, there are subtle differences around joining, etc., but the fundamental differences are centred around the user ability and functionality. Um, and we think it's actually a, a very good quality product, say, joint designed in conjunction with our partners um, and I suppose to CVP, which is a video hearing conference facility. Thank you very much. Um, Rosemary, I was wondering if you could grab this next question. Are there any processes to put in place for those who are digitally excluded? But still want to use um, video hearings? So I think, yes, that's absolutely one of those issues that needs to be considered when when determining how to hold the hearing. So digital exclusion is a, you know, can cover a multitude of things, whether that means on a on a practical basis, having access to technology or financial basis um, in terms of having any concerns about we talked earlier about, um, you know, paying for the calls and so forth, or in terms of a sort of um, usability perspective. Uh, so uh, the, the service, our, our aim for the service is basically to provide a service that is as user friendly and accessible as possible so that in those hearings where the judge considers it appropriate, for somebody to join by video, they can do that simply and easily. Um, so we 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 have we've done uh, you know quite extensive research with with um, with with users with ordinary people uh, you know testing what the screens look like and is the wording understandable is the phraseology understandable do people know um, uh, what what to expect do they understand what's what's happening and how they're expected to behave in the hearing and uh, we've designed the service so that it is as accessible and simple to use um, as possible uh, thinking about things like screen layouts wording colours. Um, uh, um, how you click through the buttons and all those sorts of things that has been really re robustly tested to make sure the, the 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 bar for entry is as low as it possibly can be because for many people including those who who might consider themselves to be digitally excluded um it still might be preferable for a number of other reasons to have your hearing over video than coming to court so we don't assume that um uh categories of of user will necessarily need one or the other mode of hearing we want to create a service that is as accessible to as many people as as possible thank you very much um and i would have actually another question on accessibility um with regards to sight impairment um, many of uh, users who are sight impaired or severely sight impaired will struggle to access face-to-face -face hearings uh, so will video hearing be an alternative can um, what can be adjusted to make video hearings more accessible for these users yeah i, th I think this is another example the the uh, your preference as a person as to whether you come to a court building physically or join by video isn't um, is, is going to depend on the nature of your sight impairment and your personal comfort with those things. And, you know, they're, 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 it really is important that we're able to listen to individual user needs uh, rather than assume that because somebody's got a sight impairment this way or that way is going to be better for them. And um, so you, 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 you're you able to say to the courts, um, you know, I have this need, um, what reasonable adjustments can be made and so forth and so on. Um, and so in terms of designing the service, we've we've been mindful of that, that um, clearly there are obvious issues in, in accessing a video service if you have a sight impairment, but there are other different challenges perhaps in getting to a physical court building if you have a sight impairment. So we, we need to provide as best we can for all our users. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Claire, uh, we have a question on how closely has HMCDS worked with disability charities in terms of ensuring its accessibility to people with relevant health conditions, um, seniors and other groups um, that contain people with low capacity and utilizing technology solutions? OK, so we have been working with the Digital Accessibility Centre um, and they have been supporting us around the design of the service. We have also reached out to other sectors to uh, gain user insight uh, and much as that has been involved in actually how we've designed the service going forward, thinking about the participants needs and trying to make sure that what we have been recommended to do has been built within the service. Thank you very much. Um, would it be possible to see guidance films for lay users? Is this available somewhere online? Um, it's a question for either of you to pick up. I think that question is referring to the films made by the, oh, sorry, Claire's answering this one, but I think it's referring to the Oxford films. Is that right, Claire? Oh, it's come back to you now, Rosie. I, I think that is the question. Yeah, can I just check, Evelyn? Is that the, the base of the question so we answer it correctly? Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm being okay. honest. If, if it is the Oxford Hills, then sorry, can you just repeat the question so I answer it properly? Yeah, sure. Uh, that would it be possible to see any guidance film, uh, guidance films for lay users? Um, they they are being created as part of the work we've been doing at Oxford University. So yes, they will be made available as and when we're ready to release them. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I have another question. Will video hearings be able to uh, used on TVs and has it been installed in the courtrooms? I can take that one if you wish. Um, video hearings is actually, um, it's a web based product, so it's not installed as such. You access it through a, a, a platform, um, so it's, it will be available to be played out through the TV screens on in courtrooms, etc. But equally, it can go through a laptop or any other media device. Um, so it, it's not quite as, as maybe as the question is anticipating, it's more to do with a web based service. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question on uh, data. Um, Rosemary, I don't know if you'd be able to get this one. Uh, thank you for the informative session. Is data being collected to understand the experience of unrepresented and vulnerable court users? If so, how's it being done? Um, so we are collecting data in a number of ways uh, we collect and there's there's some data that is sort of automated by virtue of running the service in terms of we can tell how many people used it and uh, as we assign user profiles to certain roles so there are certain um, uh, specific things that uh, are within the service so that if somebody is a, a barrister or solicitor and we know that in advance um, so we can we can kind of map that across about uh, unrepresented unrepresented uh, litigants as well. Thank you very much. Um, I believe we have time for one final question. Um, are you involved in the provision of facilities within the courts for video hearings? For example, uh, getting big enough screens or decent loudspeakers? Um, it's a question for either of you. Go on, Claire. OK, um, so yeah, I can answer this one. Um, as part of the modernisation programme, we are upgrading the infrastructure across the court service. So where there is a need to uh, enhance the various different parts of the infrastructure, we will be doing so. Um, but there are many large screens already gone into the courts as part of the upgrades over the COVID period when obviously remote hearings became much more of a thing than they were pre-COVID. So um, we will ensure that obviously there is the relevant infrastructure in place to make sure that video hearings run smoothly. Great, thank you. Um, I know I said we have question, we have time for one more question, but maybe we can squeeze in one, one or two more. Uh, when will be a service available on smartphones? Um, again, question for either of you. How timely? Claire, yeah. do you want to talk to that? <laughs> Um, it's available now as it happens. We've actually just released the feature this month, so um, we have been using it for the last two or three weeks. Um, and so, yes, anybody who wishes to join by a smartphone or a tablet is able to do so. Thank you. And will video hearings um, serve as an alternative to like Opus and uh, equip in terms of managing the electronic evidence? So the video hearings, it's important to be clear that the video hearing service isn't also a filing or case management system. It is not managing 
the evidence, uh, what it will do is allow somebody participating in a hearing to show that evidence on their screen. Um, but we are not, uh, the, the service itself won't be involved in, in managing the evidence or, or kind of um, supporting kind of pre-sharing and of electronic bundles and so forth and things like that. So I just want to make that distinction. Great, thank you very much. Um, and we have one final question, which is now this time the final question. Um, somebody was wondering if you are available tomorrow during the Q&A session. Yes, I'm going to be in the closing Q&A session for the public user event. So um, I will look forward to seeing anybody who would like to join that Q&A session then. And thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure we managed to get through all your questions, but I hope we gave it a good go and got through as many as we could uh, in the time available. It is a really important area of our work and we're delighted to have the, had the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Um, let, please do keep in touch um, and, uh, and um, I'm happy to pick up any questions specifically on video hearings that people didn't feel were answered today in the Q and A tomorrow at the end of the um, the end of the two day event? Thank you very much indeed for both you, yourself and Claire. Um, this is the end of the session. Um, if you do have any questions, then please feel free to email us on change something that matters at justice.gov.uk, and please don't forget that we have a Q and A uh, panel closing tomorrow. Thank you very much for everyone who attended.